Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon also from my side. I'm happy to be invited, not only because it's an honor, of course, to speak at such a conference, but also because I think it's a good time to talk about science communication. After the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us impressively and around the world how important science and science communication are. And I was asked here, and with that, I'll share my screen with you, to provide a research perspective on uh, trends in and the future of science communication. And I took this in two ways. I will present you some findings from research on science communication, but I will also present you findings about research and science communication, so a meta perspective on the research field, if you like. And I will do this in three steps. First, I will talk about what's going well, both in practice and in research of science communication. Then I'll talk about things that, in my opinion, are not going so well. And then I'll put forward a couple of ideas of how I think we might be able to move forward here. And as I only have 15 minutes, I try to be succinct. So first of all, what's going well? And I think the first point that's going well is that in many countries, and maybe a little contrary to the tenor of public debates and also to the tenor of debates in the scholarly community, is that we find generally positive societal attitudes towards science. Um, and one example is this one here, the Global Trust in Profession study by Ipsos, which showed in 2019 in over 22 countries that trust, that scientists and also doctors are the most trusted professions practically in all these countries. And if we look at the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, during that, we have seen what's called a rally around the flag effect in many countries. Um, we have seen that in times of crisis, people turn towards established authorities and that, for example, that's what you can see here, trust in science has risen. What you see here is data from the German Science Barometer Survey, which has documented this a couple of times over the pandemic. A second point I think that is going well is that we currently see, and we have seen over the past years, um, an increasing openness among scientists towards science communication. And we have also seen more scientists actually engaging in communication towards the public, in communicating in public. Even though we also see, it has to be said, that uh, quite a few scientists uh, do not do it, that, that fewer scientists than actually think science communication is important and would like to do it, fewer scientists actually do it. And there's reasons for that that I will touch upon later. A third point that's going well is that we have seen more and more professional, more extensive institutional communication. We have seen higher education institutions and scientific organizations putting more resources, putting more personnel towards outside communication, also producing more output, as you can see here in this study uh, by Julia Zerong and others, um, and also catering to more channels and to more audiences. And the third point is that we, in general, have seen a broad variety of sources, of places for of science communication, of places for dialogue between science and different societal groups, from museums and science centers, over fame labs and science labs, all the way to legacy media and social media. So here, looking at the practice of science communication, we see a number of good developments. And another, in my opinion, at least great development is the emergence and the consolidation also of research on science communication, a field that has been institutionalized in recent years. And there's a number of indicators that you can use to, to document this institutionalization. There are a number of journals, for example, like Public Understanding of Science, like Science Communication, like the Journal of Science Communication that have become established, that specialize in research on science communication. There's a number of introductory hand and textbooks that synthesize knowledge from the field for other scholars. Uh, there's established professional associations and conferences like the PCST, the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network that was founded in the 1980s and whose conferences attract hundreds of people regularly. There's a clear rise in scholarly publications on science communication, on research on science communication, especially as you can see here since the mid 2000s. And there is, that results from a co-citation analysis of the research field itself, there's a pronounced diversification of the field, which now encapsulates many topics, many foci, many disciplines from public science communication or science education 
to scholarly communication, to the role of open science, etc. Um, and my last point here, uh, there seems to be an increasing recognition within the field, uh, within research on, on, on science communication, that it is necessary to communicate our findings as well. Uh, and we have seen in, in recent years uh, a number of reports in many countries by scientific academies and others that translate findings from science communication research into recommendations for action. And we have that for specific topics like the COVID-19 vaccine communication handbook that you can see there. But we also have it more generally on communicating science like the OLEA uh, projects that we have seen, like the results of the German quote unquote factory WISCOM that has just been published or like the Swiss Academy's report that you see on the right there that will come out next month. Um, and there are other uh, uh, communication efforts from the science communication research community, like participatory formats, like uh, exhibitions, websites, social media campaigns, and also games like the Cranky Uncle app that you see here that aims to counteract climate change related dis and misinformation. So quite a few things are going well, but there's also things I think that are not going so well. And the first one is maybe what many of you have in mind immediately, which is the rise and also uh, the rise of contrarian and, and conspirational attitudes. What you can see pictured here is the Swiss variant of what's called the cross thinkers, the querdenker here in Switzerland that have harshly criticized anti-COVID measures. And these attitudes, these conspirational contrarian attitudes have become more visible and maybe also more accepted in different countries, uh, even though they still, as, as far as research can tell us, even though they still seem to be clearly minority positions. And we see, uh, or we have some evidence at least, that around certain science-related issues, a fragmentation of public and online debates has occurred that we actually do find things like echo chambers around issues like COVID-19, vaccination, 5G, or climate change. And we have seen, my second point, that in such controversies, that these controversies have resulted often in personal attacks on scholars, particularly on female scholars. And this has highlighted, I think, a general lack of systemic, of organizational, of peer, and also of legal support that communicating scientists should receive. And we do have studies telling us that uh, scientists, even if, they're, if they think science communication is important, or engagement with the public is important, that quite a few of them refrain from doing so because they fear public backlash and personal attacks. My third point is that uh, we have seen that organizational communication can sometimes focus strongly and maybe overtly strongly on building the, their organizational profiles, their images, their reputation. There was a German case, for example, where a research team hired a PR agency to improve visibility and public visibility, and very successfully so, um, for a study that was later harshly criticized. Or in many countries, um, we see that universities and, and uh, academic departments use ranking results often to boost their public profiles while knowing about the methodological shortcomings that many of, of these rankings actually have. And research uh, on science communication has shown what has been described as a tectonic shift, a, a crisis of the intermediaries between science and society. And this has various facets. The first one is that we have seen that science journalism, like journalism in general, but maybe even more so because it, has, it, it was a niche field within journalism to begin with, that science journalism is in an economic crisis that impacts and in fact worsens the working conditions for many science journalists. We have seen that tech platforms, digital platforms have become much more important intermediaries also of course for science related issues. But these platforms don't curate information based on quality or accuracy. They focus on maximizing attention and time spent on the platform. And we have seen that new intermediaries, oh, I forgot this, that new intermediaries like online born media, like successful social media campaigns, such as I fucking love science, which you see there, or social media influences exist in some, but unfortunately by far not in all countries and all languages. 
And if we look at uh, research on science communication, we also find some things that are not going that well. Uh, Firstly, for example, while we have a burgeoning research on science communication, this scholarship still has considerable gaps and biases. And I'll show you just two examples here. One is that uh, research on science communication focuses strongly uh, on some, and particularly on Anglophone countries, uh, whose results in turn may not be applicable to, to other countries though. And, Research on science communication also focuses very strongly on communication about STEM subjects, the natural science, sciences, if you like. So not on the social sciences, not on the arts, not on the humanities. And there are other gaps as well. Research, uh, science communication research that focuses on social media, for example, very, very strongly focuses on Twitter because Twitter is easily available. The data are easily uh, available. Whereas other platforms, and sometimes more important, more relevant platforms, are neglected or inaccessible. And there is an insufficient link between science communication scholarship, research, and science communication practice. Um, this is something that is and has been habitu habitually and often diagnosed from researchers and practitioners. And of course, it's good that some funders including the European Union, tried to address this. And this has related, uh, resulted actually in a number of large scale projects like the three uh, that you see on your screen right now that are working on it. But it's also worth noting that these projects all have a limited time span, which makes it more difficult for them to have a sustained impact. And this leads me to my last, to la the last block of my presentation here, which is the question, well, how can we move forward? And I think a first, if you like, a meta commentary here is that I think firstly, it's important to recognize the moment that we are in as a fork in the road moment. Uh, right now, we have a moment where we can and we should try to leverage the high current public interest and trust in science and in science communication into a better science communication. So, um, I think we should try to use this fork in the moment to improve science communication. Yeah. And on the one hand, of course, this has implications for the practice of science communication, something on which others can speak more competently on. But I'll at least give you two examples uh, uh, of what I think this could mean. And the first one is that I think it's clear that we need more what I have called here in reach into science, into the scientific community, not just outreach. And in reach would mean then that we have to motivate scientists to communicate and engage with and, and, and uh, engage in dialogue with the public. We have to train them accordingly. We have to sensitize them for societal demands. Scientists also have to listen to the perspectives of the public, to their worries, to their demands potentially, to their fears, uh, et cetera. We have to valorize science communication in the scientific system. And we have, I've mentioned this before, to support communicating scientists socially, emotionally, organizationally, and if push comes to shove, also legally. And the second aspect uh, that, that on the practical side of things, if you like, is that I think we should also try to use this moment to improve the situation of science society intermediaries. This means strengthening science journalism and thinking about new funding models that I think likely will have to include institutional and public funding as well. Um, it means putting pressure on tech platforms to curate science related and actually other as well, but also science related content more responsibly. And it means encouraging new intermediaries in digital formats, especially to step forward. And there are more practical measures, uh, but I would rather focus now on how to move research and science communication forward. Uh, with my last remaining few points. So apart from, from uh, these practical steps, I think we should try to strengthen research on science communication. And what we need firstly, I think, is more capacity building in, for science communication research. And this capacity building has, has three facets, at least, I think. The first one is we need individual uh, capacity building. We need to encourage young scholars to engage not only in science communication as such, but also in science communication research. And to do that, we have to provide them with career paths 
they're in this field, which lead to academic positions and professorships over time in science communication research. Intellectually, or intellectual capacity building, if you like, would mean that we need regular efforts to assess research that the state of knowledge, the status quo of research on science communication to systematically aggregate it and to make core findings available also to the scholarly, to the scientific community. And institutional capacity building means that we need long-term observations and data and organizational structures that actually support these long-term endeavors, these long-term assessments and observations. We do not only need one and two and three year projects that end and peter out, we need continuous efforts that strengthen science communication research. Relatedly, we need more and more systematic evaluations of science communication efforts to broaden the evidence base of science communication. These evaluations should, on the, on the one hand, also and explicitly include potentially negative effects, dysfunctional effects of science communication. And on the other hand, the results and the data of these evaluations should be openly available for researchers, for meta-analyses, for replication studies, etc., to consolidate what we know. Third point, I think we should balance the field more. We need more research on the global south. We need more research about communication on the social sciences and the, and the humanities, for example. And we should make these uh, uh, facets or these perspectives and these topics more visible in the journals and the publications of our field. Fourth uh, point is we should, and I'm aware that this is a broader issue that goes beyond science communication, also beyond the power of individual countries, if you like, we should try hard to get access to platform and social media data to assess digital science communication more broadly and more appropriately. And my last point, which is a bit of a tongue in cheek point, I have to admit, is I think we should apply the principles of science communication to research of science communication itself, which would mean that we have to communicate our findings, the findings from research on science communication, more to the public, to stakeholders, to policymakers on a regular basis. We should establish also a dialogue with and the participation of practitioners when it comes to pressing questions in the practitioners community or to co-creating research designs, etc. And I'm aware that all of these things that I've just mentioned, these are big questions. But as I said, uh, I think right now is a good moment to not only talk about them, but actually push some, some of them forward because the opportunity structures that we have right now are as favorable as they may ever get so we should uh, get to it and try to move something and i'm thankful that some of these discussions have taken place or will take place at the future of science communication conference already and i'm looking forward to that and with that i thank you for your attention and uh, i'm looking forward to your questions <laughs>